This week on the agenda, how China's money talks. We look at the ways the world's biggest sovereign wealth fund invests with intent. The China Investment Corporation, the CIC, ranks as the world's largest sovereign wealth fund with $1.35 trillion in assets under management. Its investments in resources and technologies are seen as strategic to enhance China's influence around the world. Zongguan Zoe Lu is a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations think tank and the author of Sovereign Funds, which tells the story of the CIC. Thanks for coming on the agenda, Zoe. Now, what made you want to write this book? Thank you very much for having me. Uh, the reason that I wanted to write this book is because I thought in the whole universe, universe of sovereign funds, China is an outlier in the sense that most of the, the world's sovereign funds are based in commodity exporting economy, whereas China is one of the world's largest commodity importing economies. So uh, from a certain degree, it does not make any sense at all. Therefore, I wanted to look into how China finance and capitalize its sovereign funds and why China want to have sovereign funds. So let's get back to basics here for, for a moment. You know, what are sovereign wealth funds? Who has them? And why are they important in international finance? Sure. Um, the world's, mo most of the world's sovereign wealth fund, uh, and here I emphasize wealth, they are based in co commodity exporting economies such as Norway, uh, Qatar, UAE, uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia. And the reason why these countries can capitalize sovereign wealth fund is because um, their global, their their domestic market is relatively small in terms of uh, both in terms of development and in terms of uh, the type of asset that they have. And when the economy has a sudden windfall, normally, especially commodity uh, eco commodity based economies, they suffer from the so-called natural resource curse. The idea is the sudden inflow of wealth. Uh, crowd out the development of industries. And uh, this, in order to better manage the, the windfall, uh, of the sudden windfall, uh, econ the, basically these economies establish this, sub, the, a gig you can consider that as a gigantic uh, piggy bank. The idea is to save for future generations, for intergeneration wealth transfer, or uh, for domestic development. I think what's interesting is, is a lot of sovereign wealth funds, they, they seem to have been established in non-Western countries. So I wonder what you think the, the role they, they have um, in um, global power play. Uh, sure. Uh, yes, indeed, a lot of these global, the so-called sovereign wealth fund are established in non-Western countries, uh, and uh, in particular, non-Western and non-democratic economies, such as uh, a good example right now would be um, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, and uh, or for that matter, Qatar's investment authority. And uh, the reason I mentioned Qatar is because, you know, recently Qatar just ha hosted the latest uh, World Cup. And uh, um, you, can make the, uh, you can make a pretty good argument to say that the, uh, Qatar's uh, World Cup is mostly or entirely financed by uh, Qatar's sovereign wealth fund. So from that perspective, um, many people have, been made, have, have argued that sovereign wealth funds are influencing global, uh, not just global finance, um, but changing in international economy or international, the structure of international finance, one boardroom after another, or uh, one sports team after, an mm -hmm. after another, because, you know, such as uh, you know, the Qatar's uh, World Cup is one example, and then uh, yeah. Saudi Arabia's PIF, Public Investment Fund, also finance um, an entire new a golf tournament. So from that perspective, they do influence global culture and global finance. And what about geopolitical events? How do they have an effect on sovereign wealth funds? 
since West, the West, since, since Russia's invasion uh, of since Russia's war against Ukraine, uh, the West, uh, both the United States and its allies and partners, have uh, collectively sanctioned Russia, including its sovereign wealth fund. Um, so, from that perspective, I would argue that sovereign funds investment are not. Uh, uncompromised geopolitical or geoeconomic strength in extreme geoeconomic or geopolitical events, they are actually uh, vulnerable to Western sanctions. Let's talk about China, because you know, their the sovereign wealth fund is it, it, absolutely enormous. It's worth more than the economy of Mexico. It's quite astonishing. And as you say, um, most of the sovereign wealth funds have been established by commodity exporting economies which China is not. Yes, uh, the, China is not a ac commodity exporting economy, and that is not because um, China doesn't necessarily have any natural resources. In fact, China is, has a lot of natural resources at home, in, both in terms of oil and gas, uh, as well, and China also uh, dominates uh, a lot of the global uh, critical mineral supply chains that are essential for the uh, for uh, the renewable transition, uh, for the clean energy transition right now. Um, but the reason why China can establish sovereign funds is part of the reason is because uh, China has a lot of foreign exchange reserves. Uh, but, you know, foreign exchange reserves by IMF definition, they are supposed to be invested in ultra liquid and low risk assets for a balance of payment purposes. And that is not how China's sovereign funds uh, are, are used for. Uh, for example, China used its foreign, the, the, the China estab by establishing CIC, China Investment Corporation, or uh, the Silk Road Fund, Ch a lot of the assets that invest, the, these funds are invested in, are in, um, in uh, Western, uh, Western companies or infrastructure projects are used to finance Belt and Road Initiative. These are not liquid assets such the, to the, in the same way as U.S. Treasury bill. So from that perspective, that's why I made the argument to say, by based upon the definition of a foreign exchange reserve, man, as well as uh, strategies to manage foreign exchange reserves, China's sovereign funds are not wealth-based, but actually in the process of establishing China's sovereign funds, the government, uh, in, the government used either implicit leverage or explicit leverage. So uh, that's why China's sovereign funds are supposed to be considered as a sovereign leveraged funds. The idea is to leverage China's uh, massive foreign exchange reserves, uh, as well as the party's political power and political control over these resources to achieve uh, geoeconomic and uh, geoeconomic goals and finance the party's global ambitions. So give us a few examples of, um, of good solid investments where this has uh, worked out nicely and maybe others where things haven't quite gone to plan. Uh, sure. Um, you know, I, I would want to take a step back by saying that despite uh, what right now China's sovereign funds, they indeed are becoming vehicles or tools for the party state to finance its global ambitions. These funds are not born uh, with the geopolitical goal. And in fact, the very first time that China used its sovereign funds or to capitalize its sovereign leverage fund is actually because of a because of a crisis. And the, the uh, this example would be Central Huijin. And the reason I mentioned Central Huijin is because actually this become a very relatively good and a, to a very large extent successful uh, example that China can mitigate perceived uh, crisis. And uh, uh, Central Huijin is very important to the restructuring of China's banking system in terms of recapitalizing China's uh, four major state-owned commercial banks and help them to go IPO um, and later to help China's to restructure China's uh, stock, uh, stock brokerage firms. And uh, uh, this same pattern, you observe the similar pattern um, in terms of you know, using central Huijin to uh, save uh, China's 
a troubled banks such as Baoshan Yinhang recently. So this is actually quite a successful example in terms of how sovereign leverage fund can be used to prevent a crisis, especially the crisis that happens at home. And then in terms of a relatively successful international investment, uh, I, would, I would argue that you know, people, might make, 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 people might evaluate, define, or evaluate success differently. Um, but I would make the argument to say that CIC's global investment so far uh, has been uh, relatively successful, not necessarily in terms of generating financial returns, but in terms of uh, building a network, have, having access to uh, top tier international financiers, as well as having access to uh, inf Western policymakers, uh, having access to key personnel that can influence uh, foreign policy. Uh, Western policy making. One such example would be uh, CIC's very first investment, right in the running up of a global financial crisis in 2007. Uh, that example would be CIC's investment in uh, Black, uh, Blackstone. And um, you know, obviously, people can make the argument, uh, including myself, you know, can make the argument saying that uh, finance 101 basically tells you if you think this is a really good investment, you do not sell. And yet, in the running, when uh, uh, the uh, BlackRock's uh, BlackRock uh, Blackstone's uh, founder Stephen Schwartzman, as well as uh, Peter Peterson, both of them sold a combined share worth billions of millions of dollars, uh, right in the running up of. Uh, before the Blackstone's uh, IPO. And CIC bought, did the pre-IPO subscription. And obviously, things did not work out during the global financial crisis. And uh, CIC suffered a lot of paper loss. But I would emphasize that is only paper loss. And CIC did not uh, sell its share until yeah. 2018. And by the time CIC sold it, it actually um, the, the, the share price was about 11% higher up than uh, the original pre-IPO subs subscription. So, so would you say sovereign wealth funds in China have been uh, adapting to the times then? Or do you think that was the plan all along? Um, I would. I would be cautious to say. To, I would be cautious uh, to the idea that China's sovereign funds, are, of when they were established, uh, they had a vision to project a power globally or adapt to um, adapt to uh, changing uh, geopolitical environment because. Around the time, because remember when uh, Central Huixin was established in the early 2000s, or CIC was established in 2007, the international environment was re was still relatively friendly to China, and at that time, China was mostly, in, especially in the case of uh, Central Huixin, the purpose was really to deal with China's domestic banking crisis or emerging banking crisis. It was not to uh, project China's financial influence overseas. And it was not until uh, the global financial crisis or in the aftermath of global financial crisis, uh, the idea of the rise of China versus the perhaps at that moment the downfall uh, of American bank American financial system hence American hegemon really that that kind of a narrative triggered a um, or enhanced a pre-existing debate in terms of how China should better manage its booming or growing foreign exchange reserves and obviously CIC's um, investment loss because of investing heavily is heavy exposure to America's financial uh, sector uh, offered a political opportunity for a safe or the state administration of foreign exchange, which is the foreign exchange reserve yeah. management arm of the People's Bank of China, offered a safe a, a, a political opportunity to uh, expand its influence in terms of actively managing foreign exchange reserves. You're talking about um, political opportunities, but I wonder if this doesn't all create some strategic vulnerabilities too. I mean, might holding a lot of reserves become a burden, in which case is having a big sovereign wealth fund a strength or is it maybe 
a weakness. That's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, when China accumulates a lot of foreign exchange reserves, at one point around 2014, at one point China's foreign exchange reserves was more than uh, $4 trillion uh, temporarily, right? And since then, China's foreign exchange reserves have been uh, maintaining above uh, $3 trillion. So uh, the, in terms of vulnerability, that does make China, China's uh, reserve management vulnerable to volatilities in uh, the US, in US asset market, especially the value of US treasuries um, and uh, the stability of the US dollar because most of these uh, foreign exchange reserves managed by the monetary authority or the central bank, the People's Bank of China, is, ex is invested in uh, dollar-denominated assets, and mostly U.S. treasuries. So a lot of the, the rationale, the debate back then was that, well, when the U.S. When US treasury depreciated, that basically means China uh, become very uh, passively uh, and become be, become hijacked in terms of value depreciation. Therefore, that's a not that 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 was a very strong uh, support for the argument in terms of reserve management diversification. And but but we have to bear in mind. Diversify away from low risk asset or risk free asset, which the benchmark in international finance for risk free asset is U.S. Treasury, right? Yeah. So, uh, so from that perspective, the moment you diversify away from that, you expose yourself to a higher uh, risk. Song Yang, Zoe Liu, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Still to come here on the agenda, from golf to airlines, how global sovereign wealth funds are investing in everything, everywhere, all at once. We are all connected. Across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda. Sovereign wealth funds are some of the world's biggest investors. The World Bank says $10 trillion is being managed through sovereign wealth funds in 2021. That was up 120% from 2008. Let's talk about global wealth trends with Michael Madul, president of the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute. Um, Michael, thanks ever so much for coming on the agenda. Now, sovereign wealth funds, they, they're an investment tool that's been around since the 1950s, but why is it only now that there's this real buzz about them? Well, you just mentioned the size of the sovereign wealth fund investor market, over $10 trillion. So they definitely have a very large impact on listed markets. When a wealth fund goes into a stock or an investment, um, it has a significant amount of change. Um, also, they also impact public policy, right? Um, you had recently in the news today a live golf tournament by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund um, ended up merging with the PGA Tour. And um, there's now legislation um, you know, by one of the U.S. senators on possibly changing uh, one of the tax codes for large sovereign wolf. And so, they look, they have a very large um, impact on markets um, in, in many different industries and sectors. Now, they can invest in anything, like you said, from sports to, to, to bonds, to, to stocks, to real estate. But I wonder if that broad scope means that there's potential for, for things to go wrong. And can you give us some examples that, which may be highlight the concerns around SWFs, aside from just losing money? So the more advanced you go on the asset allocation table of beyond stocks and bonds, uh, going down the chain of real estate and infrastructure, you can run into a lot of issues. 
um, you know, the reason why we created our transparency index back in 2008 was to allay um, policymakers' concerns about sovereign wealth funds' intentions, right? You have these foreign state actors investing in other countries, which could be in areas that are of high national security interest. So with that being said, um, there are a lot of implications on this. Um, but right, you mentioned that not just looking at investment returns as a serious issue of losing money by a sovereign wealth fund, but what influence can a sovereign wealth fund have on a country? Um, and like I said, uh, those instances can be a, a very wide range and have national security implications. Now, traditional um, sovereign wealth funds invest excess national wealth. Um, that's what we've seen in the oil producing um, nations like Norway, and that allowed that to become absolutely enormous with a you know, $1.4 trillion fund. But Saudi Arabia's fund, which you mentioned before, investing in sport and that sort of thing, it's different, isn't it? Because as well as lending, it borrows um, as well. Because since it's become a global investor, um, its budget deficit its budget was in deficit. So how does that change how sovereign wealth funds work? Great question. Well, sovereign wealth funds are dynamic investors. So um, if they can use leverage to enhance their investment, then they'll do it. So when interest rates were really low, sovereign wealth funds tap the debt market. So PIF is one example that we just mentioned. Um, you have Tamasic Holdings in Singapore also raises capital, as well as Mubadla, which is a UAE-based sovereign wealth fund, um, actually out of Abu Dhabi. They also raise capital as well. So they do that so that they can leverage, enhance the returns, um, trying to maximize um, their use of capital. And yes, yeah, so when you look at their total assets, a portion of those um, is debt. Now, one advantage is that they get debt at a really cheap price, government pricing, right? Because they're sovereign wealth funds. So again, that's why you see many of them. PIF is very aggressive on acquisitions. Same thing as Tamasek and Mubadla. So let's talk a little bit more about Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund. Um, really trying to boost tourism, to, to get into sport. Um, I think even an airline um, is one of the, the assets that it's keen on. Um, big investments there. That, so really, sovereign wealth funds can, can be used for many different things. Right. There's many different types of sovereign wealth funds. You have the traditional sovereign wealth funds that act as pools. Um, from a central bank. So, for example, some sovereign wealth funds might only invest in fixed income. You have Norway sovereign wealth fund, the massive sovereign wealth fund from all that oil wealth. That sovereign wealth fund tra traditionally only invested in fixed income and stocks. They're holders of many stocks and in many indices across the world. Now they are investing in renewable assets. Talking about PIF, Mubala, Tamasek, and some of the other sovereign wealth funds, we call them strategic development sovereign wealth funds. So their mandate goes beyond just commercial returns. Um, part of it is creating jobs within the country. Pre, uh, and you mentioned tourism, right? So uh, uh, the MBS has a vision. Vision 2030 is to attract and bring people in Saudi Arabia, whether it's tourism, whether it's uh, financial services, et cetera. Now, tourism is very unique. Tourism is a catalyst to bring in money. A lot of countries do this. Tourism brings in hotels, real estate, right? So you have money in that sector. And then you also have recurring money coming in from visitors all the time. So the PIF is very keen on building its tourist sector. And in terms of intentions um, and influence that, that some sovereign wealth funds might be, be, be trying to, to enhance, that they're not all as transparent um, as each other, are they? You mentioned that you've got your transparency um, um, tracker, but I, I just wonder what steps are being taken and where. I know that Norway's come out qu quite um, high in terms of transparency ratings, but it's not the same for them all. Right. Transparency has always been an issue for sovereign wealth funds because we're talking about state-owned actors, right? If you look at the corporate governance of various sovereign wealth funds, there are ties to the executive branch of those nations. Sometimes they're tied to a board of a, of a central bank. So being state-owned, there's an extra layer of caution of, of why sovereign wealth funds should be transparent and how it would create a level of investment reciprocity between nations, right? Bilateral trade. 
So we came up with our transparency index. There's also the Santiago principles, which was created, uh, you know, back in 2007, eight, um, to allay concerns about the intentions of state owned actors, AKA sovereign wealth funds. And so, yes, um, this is something that uh, Norway is overly transparent. I, in my personal belief, right, you can go on their website, you can look at all their bond holdings, you can see all their equity holdings. Um, but a lot of sovereign wealth funds are opaque. They don't tell you how large they are. They don't tell you what's in their portfolio. Even though some of them sit on boards of these transparent organizations, they're still not transparent themselves. And so, and, and point number two that I do want to make is that it, it does hold a level of accountability to the public of that country. So as a citizen of a nation, whether you're in Singapore, in the Middle East, um, it's good to know how large your sovereign wealth fund is and making sure that the public resources are properly managed. I, I, with the investment focus being global, I, I wonder then, and you, you mentioned local populations, what, what are the implications for, for local economies? I mean, do, does sovereign wealth fund activity make better or poorer choices at home? You know, that's a good question. Um, at first, people were scared of sovereign wealth fund money. That was back in 2008. But the world's changed. People are used to sovereign wealth funds. And so a lot of governments, um, they want wealth fund capital to flow within their country. We saw this with the UK. Um, now we're seeing this with India. And so there is a lot of government accommodation to attract this capital. Now, sovereign wealth funds buying stocks, that creates liquidity in a market. So that's great for everybody. If you're a retail investor, you can benefit from that. Sovereign wealth funds investing in infrastructure, whether it's brownfield, which will enhance a highway, a toll road, a bridge, or greenfield, right? Now people, now people of that country can benefit from a new piece of infrastructure, a port, an airport, right? So the there's a big change of why countries want sovereign wealth funds. Now, when it comes to competition, yes, they are competing against other investors within that country. So in, in the United States, there's lots of companies on listed markets, right? Sovereign wealth funds are competing against private equity firms and other investors on those assets, or sometimes they're collaborating with each other as a co-investor but they will participate in other bidding groups. Um, and sometimes you might have two bidding groups where each bidding group has a, a sovereign wealth fund. China's sovereign wealth fund is now bigger than, than Norway's. How big do you think sovereign wealth funds could get? Okay, so the China Investment Corporation, that's one of the you know, major sovereign wealth funds, a large portion of that um, is composed of Chinese state banks. So if you, if you cut that piece out, um, it's much smaller, but still a sizable pool of capital. Now, how big are sovereign wealth funds going to get? It's interesting because they're, most of the sovereign wealth funds, or a good portion of them, are funded from oil and gas industries. Okay, So um, as the price of oil and gas remains quite high, then those sovereign wealth funds will grow much larger in size. So the wealth funds were panicking back in 2014, 15, 16, when oil was really low. Now we're in a territory where um, they're, they're getting lots of capital coming in and they're investing that capital and being strategic. So they're buying up distressed assets. They're becoming bigger lenders in various markets, right? In credit markets, in real estate markets, which is really needed right now. And so, yeah, we think the sovereign wealth fund market, you know, on the 10 trillion, 11 trillion dollar path could be 15, 20 trillion dollars um, you know, in the next, you know, five to eight years. And that will really be driven by the oil and gas sovereign wealth funds, probably a lot less by the Asian sovereign wealth funds. Michael Modwell, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming soon on the agenda, trade and de-dollarisation. We look at the big themes under discussion at the upcoming BRICS Summit. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all of the Agenda team here in London, goodbye. <laughs>